with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. The Simple Truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Hayes. It is great to be back with you on The Simple Truth, where we proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and His Catholic Church. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the pure, strong heart of St. Joseph. It is Throwdown Thursday, where we focus on themes of spiritual warfare and the real challenges that are before us, all to better understand the battles that we're in to actively, effectively engage in fighting the good fight, to participate with the grace of God that is being lavished upon us, and to share in the victory of Christ, now and for all eternity. Let's also remember the quote often attributed to St. Joan of Arc, all battles are first won or lost in the mind. All right, today we're going to do a very, uh, very, very important topic. It's, it's a little bit different than what we normally do here, but this topic is called the world of Marian apparitions. Normally, we're sticking to um, catechism, gospel. We're just hitting the, the meat and the potatoes here, but, uh, but, but, but Our Lady. Now, we always want to look to Our Lady. She is certainly key to living the, the, the Christian uh, discipleship well, to living the Catholic faith well. Uh, what a what a wonderful, most amazing gift of God that we have, that God would come to us, not only come to us, but actually even then um, share his mother with us there from the cross. Behold your mother, mother, behold your son there with the apostle John. Let us receive our mothers. Let us, be, let us behold our mother Mary and receive our mother Mary. And so these private revelations, these Marian apparitions that occur, that have been occurring all around the world for quite some time, they, um, they are important, right? They, they are not necessary, as it is said, of private revelation for our belief. Um, we, we, the gospel is enough. The, the revelation of Jesus to us and through his church is enough for sure. Um, but these are gifts. These are gifts from heaven given to us for a reason. We'd be wise to take a look at them from time to time, to study them, to see what is the church approved and why? What is Our Lady saying here? What is the purpose of these messages? What what of the gospel is, is being emphasized here in our time and what is important for us to see? So we're going to get into some of that today and we're going to do it in this book that um, is a great book, The World of Marian Apparitions. And uh, this is a book that the National Catholic Register has called the greatest visual compilation of modern Marian apparitions ever assembled. And it's actually become Sophia Institute Press's top performing book ever. You can get it at sophiainstitute.com. It begins with Fatima. Are the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima, and then it presents the many apparitions of Our Lady that have appeared since. You can see the cover if you're watching the, vi- the video today, very beautifully done, and, uh, and that's what you can expect throughout the entire book. Um, it's written by a, a Mariologist, Ven- Vincenti Lajewski. And he reveals them all in breathtaking fashion in this unparalleled encyclopedic work. I'm hoping uh, that I'm doing uh, justice to the pronunciation of, uh, of this Polish Mariologist who has put this great work together for us. But again, highly recommend it. SophiaInstitute.com is where you can get it, the world of Marian apparitions. But what I want to do today is, is open up the phone lines. I want to go to our emails, and I just want to go to some of the apparitions in this book and share them with you. I'm, I'm blown away by, by reading this book. And we, we were expecting to have a, uh, a spokesperson on from Sophia Institute Press with us today uh, to go through some of this book with us. Um, that didn't work out at the last moment uh, for whatever reason. And so, um, so I'm going to be relying on some audience participation today. What's your favorite Marian apparition and why? What, what, uh, what, what jumps out to you in terms of the messages um, that Our Lady has sent and the, the appearances of our Lord as well that go along with a lot of these Marian 
Marian apparitions, um, the, most people are quite aware of Our Lady of Fatima, the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima. Well, this book, about the first 80 pages of this 400 page book is, is spent on, on the different aspects of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima. And, uh, you know, Our Lady of Fatima, that was instrumental for me, a big part of my conversion actually back to the church when I was in my early 20s, just because of location where I was in Western New York and where I was I was spending time in prayer and then returning to back to confession for the first time at the Our Lady of Fatima Shrine. So that had me, that was drawing me in. Our Lord was drawing me in to learn more about the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima. But, but even so, there are details, there are things, there are aspects where Our Lady keeps appearing to Sister Lucia over time that um, this book lays out and compiles in a way that, um, you know, you just have it all together there. You can read through it. It's very, very helpful. And then it goes on from there. Um, I do want to bring in a text, uh, I'm sorry, an email that we got earlier and, and just bring this in right now because it's a good question that applies to right now. And that is um, an anonymous um, listener in Boston, Massachusetts says, thanks for this topic. There's a Marian apparition in Marian apparitions in U.S. in Wisconsin. Can you talk about that? And so I just want to say that this book in particular begins with Our Lady of Fatima, which was 1917 and then going forward. So that's what you're going to find in this book. That apparition that you're talking about um, in terms of uh, this email, this uh, Marian apparition in Wisconsin, this is an apparition that took place in 1859 in Wisconsin. So it's outside the scope of this book, but we did do an interview with an author that, um, that took on this apparition and helps people to understand it. She does does it in a, a sort of historical fiction novel called The Woman in the Trees. So you can find this book, The Woman in the Trees. It's all about that apparition of Our Lady in Wisconsin, 1859. The author's name is Theone Bell. The publisher is Tan Books. So I believe it's tanbooks.com. You can go there and learn more. But that is a very important apparition that is emphasizing some very important things. But all of these apparitions are really emphasizing um, some key aspects for us, right? The, the gospel for us. Um, at all times, but specifically in our time when there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of evil in the world. It seems to be advancing at rapid pace, and Our Lady is saying penance. Our Lady is saying prayer, the Holy Rosary, pray, 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 offer sacrifice uh, for sinners, for the conversion of sinners, for the salvation of souls, offer reparation for, for offenses committed against the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so this is for our time. Look, I think these all kind of line up in saying that our faith is not about ease. Our faith is not about comfort. It's about authentic love. It is about our Lord on the cross. And so if we understand that, that changes our whole life. It's not just about my own comfort, my own preferences. What do I feel like right now? It's about setting up a, a, a rule of life, a rhythm of life, a plan of life that has real pillars of prayer throughout the day, striving to pray without ceasing, striving to pray the Holy Rosary and pray it well, to really meditate on the mysteries, to really dive in and fight off the distractions, which takes effort and, and continuing to go back to our Lord's grace for his help. So it's going to take effort and it takes more effort than, than, than normally what feels good, right? So it's going to entail sacrifice and entering into the pain. If we know that, if we understand that that's what it is and that it's, an, it's not just about like some just entering into pain for the sake of pain. No, it's for the sake of love, right? This is how we live authentic love. This is how we pick up our cross in union with our Lord and we walk with him and we offer ourselves with him to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit for others and our lady is interceding for us. We are with her in this as well, as well as all of the holy saints and holy angels. Uh, we are blessed. We've got the treasure here, but it ought to compel us with great love to receive that treasure and then to put great effort in to participate with those graces and that means doing the hard things when they don't feel good but guess what happens over time when we do this when we pray more and more when we do penance more and more when we offer reparation more and more out of love what's going to happen is they're going to become habits and they become easier over time we build the virtues we build the good habits and then it becomes more and more 
um, part of our own just natural freedom. We become free of the things that were so hard before. And so, yeah, there's always going to be some deal, uh, some bit of hardship that we've got to pick up our cross on for sure. But these are the areas we really got to be serious about it. And the, the duties of our vocation and the apostolic works that God is calling us to, but it all goes back to prayer at the core and entering into that pain that we are called to, the good that we are called to, the, 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 and making really a sacrifice of that. All right. So um, we're going to get into this today. We're coming up on the first break, but this is the topic, the world of Marian apparitions. I'm going to break some down as we go, but I also want to hear from you the number to call in or text one 511 5483 That's one 511 5483 one thing that uh, I experienced going through parts of this book, and I haven't read this entire book. Normally, by the time uh, I'm ready to do an interview or, or present a book or something on this show of that nature, I've read through every single word of the book. That's just how I do it. But in this case, the 400-page book, taking some time with it, prayerfully pondering it, sharing it with my wife and children, uh, it's taken me a little bit more time to work through it. I'd say probably about half of the book I've gotten through at this point. But one of the amazing things is that different apparitions I've never heard of before, and even church-approved apparitions that I've never heard of before. And when I read through them, I'm amazed and I'm saying, why have I never heard about this? Why have we not heard about this? Why isn't this so well-known? Why don't, why don't I know about this? I'm in, in circles with solid, faithful Catholics. I've never heard anybody talk about this before. Well, when we get back, we're, we're going to dive in. Uh, to a couple of those. We're going to start with one that uh, th this is not necessarily a church approved one, but we're going to talk about some distinctions in that as well. Um, but this one sure, certainly seems like the real deal to me, and I'll present it to you for your, your prayerful pondering and your discernment. But it took place in Mexico City in 2007, 2007 in Mexico City at the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, I don't know if you've heard about this one, but this is one that, a very simple one. And when I heard about this, I just, I can't believe I've never heard about this before. Again, if you want to call in, what's your favorite apparition? Maybe it's off the beaten path a little bit. It might be in this book. We can talk about it. one 511 5483 That's one 511 5483 We're going to be right back with the world of Marian apparitions. Stay tuned. This is Jesse Romero, host of Jesus 911, heard weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. I'm joined each day by a variety of co-hosts like Ruben Nava, Paul Clay, Dan Schneider, and my amazing wife, Anita Romero. We tackle Catholic devotions, spiritual warfare, family life, saving America, and everything in between. Join us each weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for Jesus 911. You can also catch a bonus encore Saturdays at noon Eastern. God bless you. Keep the faith. Are you holding on to an old car or truck because you think dealers won't want it? Then consider donating it to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. This is a great way to turn your unvalued vehicle into a powerful gift for Catholic Radio. You'll be taking part in our evangelization efforts to continue spreading Christ's love throughout the world. Our Lord uses Catholic Radio to draw more people to Himself, and one of the best ways to support the Station of the Cross is by contributing to our vehicle donation program. The process is safe and simple. Your generosity will greatly benefit our mission to bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners. To find out more or to donate your vehicle today, visit thestationofthecross.com or call 1-866-628-CARS. That's the station of the cross.com or 1 866 628 2277. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Thank you for your continued support, and may God bless you and your family. Welcome back to the 
Simple Truth, Jim Havens here. We are talking about Marian apparitions today and specifically doing so with the book, The World of Marian Apparitions. It's a big book, an encyclopedic sort of book from the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima going forward. And uh, you can get it at sophiainstitute.com, sophiainstitute.com. If you want to call in, talk about any Marian apparition that you want to share today, maybe your experience uh, with it in some way and learning about it and it making an impact in your life, or just something that um, is an apparition that maybe a lot of people don't know about th- that you might want to talk about or see if it's in this book, one 511 5483 one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. All right, let's go to Mexico City, two thousand seven. Now, this one, um, the, the book works in an interesting way. It gives you little icons at the front of the picture of each um, apparition title page. So here we only have one icon, and these icons are going to direct you to say, okay, how, how much is this church approved? What kind of uh, devotion is there to this? So on and so forth. Well, this one. Um, It doesn't have um, the icons as far as being recognized by the Vatican um, or the Pope visiting the apparition site or anything like that, but it only has this one icon, and this is the icon of an apparition that is accepted by the belief of pilgrims. Um, so a very a very simple sort of um, piece of evidence is that there are there have been pilgrims there that um, they accept this as as true as really happening based on the evidence that they see. And I have to say, when when you hear about this, at least for me, um, you hear about it, you can see the evidence for yourself, and it sure seems legitimate. And uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit how we can kind of discern that. But but first, let's just present this. This is Mexico City, two thousand seven. I'm just going to read a bit of the book um, to, to, to lay this out here. It says, Defenders of the Unborn say that the Virgin of Guadalupe uses extraordinary miracles to reveal her solicitude for all life. The most recent well-known miracle occurred on April 24, 2007. On that day, the Mexico City Legislature voted to legalize abortion on demand. After the vote, a mass for the protection of the unborn was celebrated in the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe. When the liturgy came to an end, a strange phenomenon occurred. The center of the Guadalupe image began to glow with a bright light. The thousands of people who had gathered to pray began taking photographs. All of the images registered the same phenomenon. Subsequent analysis of the photographs and the light present in the sanctuary revealed that the image was not caused by outside reflecting lights or other artificial means Engineer Louis Giro, who studied the photographs, confirmed their authenticity and recognized that the image had been neither modified nor altered by superimposition of another image, for example. And Giro was quoted as saying that the light literally comes from the inside of the image of Mary. It is very white, pure, and intense, different from the light typically created by flashes. Perhaps most astonishing was what Giro discovered inside the light. The light is surrounded by a halo and seems to float within the abdomen of the Virgin. Indeed, if one examines the image even more precisely, one can see within the halo certain shaded areas that have characteristics of a human embryo within its mother's womb. But the people gathered did not need a scientific analysis to know that on April 27th, the unborn Christ appeared to them in the womb of his mother. This is amazing because there's photographic evidence. And when you look at the photographs, there it is right there in the womb of Mary, in that miraculous image to begin with, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the the tilma right there, showing up is this light, and it is in the shape of a human embryo right there in the womb of Our Lady on the day where Mexico City voted to legalize abortion on demand. I mean, this is incredible. Then you have scientists studying the photographs and saying, this is not coming from outside. This is coming from inside the image. So look, on discernment on this, look, we can wait until the bishop there in Mexico City makes it 100%, gives it his full stamp of approval, um, or wait for the Vatican, or wait for the Pope to visit, or something like that. But on something like this, the simple faith of the pilgrims and the simple faith of you and I as pilgrims seeing the evidence and lining it up and saying... 
That sure seems real to me. And what would be the message here? Would, would there be anything that would be um, negative in this message? This message would surely be proclaiming the gospel of our Lord Jesus, who identified himself with the least of these, who we know about episodes in his life as an embryo, as an unborn child in the womb of Mary. Um, the, the, his conception, certainly, and um, the, his incarnation there, the Annunciation there. And so um, so we've got that, and then we've got the visitation, um, where literally we've got another unborn child, John the Baptist, reacting to him inside the womb of his mother. So, um, so look, our Lord appearing here, um, giving us a glimpse of himself here, pointing to the womb of Mary and pointing to himself there, making himself known as identifying himself with every um, with every person, including from the moment of conception fertilization, that makes sense. And, and that's the gospel of Matthew 25 too. It's uh, whatever you do, the least of these, you do it unto me. He's reminding us of that, right? This is a powerful, powerful message being sent here on a very important day. So have you heard of that before? I never heard of that before. That's incredible. Give me a call. Let me know if you've ever heard about that before, what you think. I'd love to hear from somebody today and uh, and have a little conversation on these things. So feel free to call in or text one 511 5483 Frank in uh, Bill Ricca, Massachusetts, he sent a, an email in, and he's wondering how can Catholics verify the message of a Marian apparition for themselves. And I would just say, look, it is good to make sure that these things are church approved before you put too much stock in them, if they are extensive messages, right? If there's a lot that's being said, if there's a lot to the message, especially if you're being told to maybe do something in some way, um, it might be good to say, hey, is this thing church approved? What's going on here before I I get too deep into this? For me personally, I've never been one to really um, dive into the all the apparitions too much other than just the tried and true ones that that I've come across that are rock solid church approved like Fatima, Guadalupe, uh, Lourdes, you know, things like that. Even, um, um, you know, there have been some others that La Salette, you know, uh, there's been a time where I studied that a bit. Uh, there, there's a bunch, right, that we know of that are tried and true church approved. Um, but there are even some that are church approved that maybe you're not aware of. I, I want to go to one of those now, share one of those with you. This is um, in, in Borang, Belgium, back in 1932. Borang, Belgium, 1932. This one has all the icons on its title page, including church approved, the Pope visited it, all kinds of stuff, miracles here, everything. And uh, this is entitled The Madonna with the Golden Heart. So let me share a little bit on this one. This one does have some messages involved. It says, look, numerous supernatural phenomena occurred in Belgium during the years 1932, 1933. Look, this is significant because what's the time period here? Right before World War II in Belgium, which is going to see a lot of a lot of pain and suffering coming their way from Nazi Germany. So um, claims of Marian apparitions spread throughout the country, drawing both awe and ridicule, but also changing lives and inspiring conversions. Two sets of apparitions have been officially confirmed by the church. One is Beno, the other is Borang where Mary appeared 33 times to a group of children. 15 years had passed since the apparitions in Fatima and the Blessed Mother's prophecies were beginning to be fulfilled. Soviet Russia had begun to build a global empire. In Italy, Mussolini was attacking the church and in Germany, Hitler was rapidly climbing the rungs of power. Across Europe, communists and fascists exacerbated the social unrest caused by the global economic depression. Plagued by unemployment, the peoples of Europe joined long bread lines influenced by atheist propaganda, the dire economic and political situation, and the church's failure to pay attention to their suffering, many formerly devout Catholics left their faith. And so it is easy to accuse these people of ill will, but as Mary revealed at Borang, heaven appealed to them with great love and mercy. God chose these religiously indifferent people to receive an important message from his mother. Um, so these five Borang uh, visionaries, they they, um, they had little to do with the faith. Their families had little to do with the faith. They didn't know any faithful Catholics except for uh, Mrs. de Gembre, a widow who sometimes attended Mass. But the Voisins did not think about God at all. The only reason Hubert Voisin sent his 13-year-old daughter, Gilberte, to a school run by the Sisters of Christian Doctrine was that the child had no appetite and we knew that the sisters could make children eat. 
It was Gilberte's studies at the Catholic Academy that gave the Blessed Mother an opportunity to appear to her and four other children, Gilberte's siblings, 15-year-old Fernande and 11-year-old Albert, as well as the de Jambre sisters, Andre and little Gil- Gilberte, who were 14 and 9, respectively. Every evening, the four of them met Gilberte at the Academy and walked home with her. On November 29th, 1932, the four children were on their way to the Academy. They entered through the gate of the convent garden, which was enclosed by a low iron fence. On the left, they could see a railroad embankment with a tall viaduct. Across from the viaduct was a grotto of Our Lady of Lords. The children rang the doorbell and waited, stomping their feet in the cold. Then Albert turned toward the viaduct. Look, he called out. The Blessed Mother, dressed in white, is walking above the viaduct. The other children thought he was joking. Those are car lights, said one of the girls, without even looking at the viaduct. But Albert was not joking. His face, so full of delight, made everyone turn toward the embankment. Indeed, there was a woman walking on a white cloud. The terrified children began banging on the door. At that same moment, Gilberte and the porter appeared. The girl looked in the direction the excited children were pointing. Oh, she exclaimed. The porter saw nothing. The the figure can't move by itself, she said, thinking the children were talking about the statue of Our Lady of Lords in the grotto. The visionaries ran home as fast as they could. Nobody believed their story. When another vision occurred the following day, Mrs. de Gembray became convinced that someone was misleading the children. She decided to expose the prankster. Armed with a heavy stick, she went to the academy building. Five adults accompanied her. That evening, the Blessed Mother appeared four times, first on the main path leading through the garden, next halfway between the convent and the grotto of Our Lady of Lords, then once again between the grotto and the gate, and finally under the hawthorn bush growing by the fence. Mrs. de Jambray did not see anyone, but the children did. At the sight of the Holy Mother under the hawthorn bush, they fell to their knees and began to recite the Hail Mary in thin, peculiar voices. Now, I'm going to leave off here as we're about to hit the break. And when we come back, I'm going to get into the message here. What did Our Lady say here? What was the message to these unfaithful people? The visionaries coming from an, from unfaithful families in an unfaithful culture at this time. Mass, mass apostasy has taken place in Borang, Belgium at this time. But Our Lady is coming there. And I want to give you this reflection. Why Our Lady? Why is Our Lady appearing? Why isn't it Our Lord, Jesus, that is appearing so often? Why is it her that's appearing more often, bringing the messages? And my reflection on that is this. Look, you cannot really believe in Jesus truly and fully without believing in the truth about Mary. And so in this time where we have Protestantism, where we have people who want to say, Lord, Lord, and even if they're sincere in striving to have a faith in Jesus, but if they're rejecting his mother, if they're rejecting the Catholic Church, then they are rejecting him in some very real way. Whether you know they have some degree of knowledge on that to one degree or another, that's, that's not for us to necessarily judge. But we can judge the fact that um, they don't fully know Jesus if they don't know Our Lady. And if they're not in the Catholic Church believing all the truths of the Catholic faith. And so why would Our Lady show up? Because this is a truth that needs to be accepted in our time. If they get that right, if people get the truth about Mary right, then they're going to get the truth about Jesus right. They're going to get the truth about his church right. They're going to get the truth about the sacraments right. Everything starts to fall in place if you start to get the truth about Our Lady right. And if you start to have faith in Our Lady and believe in who she is as the greatest of all saints, not God, but the greatest of all human beings who have participated with the grace of God. So we're going to get back into it when we get back. Stay tuned. Message of Borang when we get back. Church approved. We'll be right back on The Simple Truth. Stay tuned. This is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. Opponents of abortion are trying to process the apparent friendship between U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Pope Francis. Reports say the abortion-friendly speaker also received communion at Vatican Mass. Dr. James Studnicki with the Charlotte Lozier Institute has long said the twin myths of dangerous pregnancies but safe abortion comes from incomplete data in U.S. states. Nevertheless, the three minority justices in Dobbs cite such faulty data in their opinion, saying that pregnancy is 14 times more dangerous than abortion. The accomplished professor and researcher says any study using complete data comes to the opposite conclusion. The pro-abortion justices declare for posterity their faulty reasoning. 
This is Life News Radio. A culture of life has a rarely mentioned but very formidable enemy. Pornography is material that deceives its consumers into thinking that they possess beauty, while the reality is they are possessed by a lie. The first step may be to talk openly with your pastor or confessor. Reject the lie and recognize that a culture of life relies upon you. Polls continue showing the importance of pro-life activism in the coming election. A brand new YouGov Economist poll shows the overturning of Roe v. Wade is not giving abortion industry political experts the polling numbers they hoped for. The Biden White House is laying out five ways they intend to perpetuate abortion. One keystone of their plan is to defend the practice of shipping chemical abortions, even where states ban abortion pills without medical supervision. A website also directs teens into secret abortions without parents knowing. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. Back to the Simple Truth, Jim Havens here. We are going through the world of Marian apparitions today. It is a book, the, the best-selling book of, uh, of Sophia Institute Press of all time. And you can get it at sophiainstitute.com. We left off in this church-approved ap- apparition in 1932, Borang, Belgium. Uh, let's just return to where we were. The messages from Our Lady are about to begin. Here it is. The next evening, the gate to the convent was closed and fierce dogs let loose. The Mother Superior had decided to put an end to the farce. Yet Mary appeared again under the hawthorn, as she would as she would for all subsequent visits. She wore a long white dress that radiated a blue glow. Her hands were folded in prayer. She had a beautiful smile and blue eyes. She looked very young. Upon seeing her, the children knelt on the cobblestone path. Finally, the children spoke to her. Are you the Immaculate Virgin? asked Albert. The woman nodded. What do you wish? For you to be good always, said the Blessed Mother in her first words to the children. On December 6th, Mary appeared with a rosary. From then on, the children prayed the rosary while waiting for the visitations, and during them, they continued praying. The Blessed Virgin Mary instructed the visionaries to come on December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and a crowd gathered in anticipation of a miracle or a special sign. The apparition was extraordinary, but the crowd did not realize what was happening until they saw the children fall into ecstasy. After the apparition, Fernande confessed, I saw nothing, not the hawthorn, fences, trees, or people. I saw only the Blessed Virgin Mary who was smiling at us. Those gathered around the visionaries began testing them. They burned them with matches and pricked them with needles, but the children didn't flinch. They shined flashlights in their eyes, but their pupils didn't even dilate. When the apparition ended, the children bore no sign of having been injured. Just think, Dad, said Gilberte to to her father. They wanted me to believe that they pricked me and burned me with fire. On December 17th, the Holy Mother asked for a chapel to be built. Four days later, she told the children, I am the Immaculate Virgin. When asked why she revealed herself, she answered, so that people may come here on pilgrimages. On December 28th, she announced that she would soon be coming for the last time. The next day, as she said goodbye to the children, a golden heart surrounded by rays of light appeared on her breast. Fernande saw it first, followed by Gilberte and Andre. Mary said, pray, pray a great deal. On the last day of the year, all the children saw the Immaculate Heart. The next day, Gilberte heard the Blessed Mother say, always pray. And on January 2nd, Mary announced, I will speak to each one of you separately. January 3rd was the day of the last apparition. First, the Blessed Mother appeared to all the visionaries except for Fernande. She entrusted them with a secret. To Gilberte, she passed on a promise, I will convert sinners. Along with a personal secret, she told Andre, I am the Blessed Mother and the Queen of Heaven. Pray always. Before she departed, she showed the children her golden heart once more. While the four visionaries went to the convent, the distraught Fernande remained under the hawthorn and continued to pray the rosary. Suddenly, she heard a loud bang like a lightning bolt and saw a fireball on the bush. She wasn't the only one to perceive it. Many people heard the loud noise and saw a strange fire. 
These dramatic events seem to indicate that Mary wanted to bring special attention to her last meeting with Fernande. The conversation was short, yet important. In the words of Mary, do you love my son? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Then sacrifice yourself for me. Then Mary showed Fernande her heart and said goodbye. Now from here, miracles begin to multiply, healings, all sorts of things take place. It's approved by the church. Uh, Pope John Paul II visits there. Um, Just amazing. And, And so what I love about this apparition is the simplicity of it coming to a people who have lost their faith and drawing them back to the faith with what is most essential in the gospel, right? What is most essential in the gospel. And we're, I'm going to draw that out, but first just I'm going to skip forward here to the um, just what it says about this message in the book here at the, at the conclusion here. It says, during these apparitions, Mary used not only words, but also gestures to communicate with the children. In Borang, she did not speak about her immaculate heart. She showed it to the children. Interestingly, the visionaries followed Mary's example of silent witness. They all started families and lived quiet lives. As one theologian said, perhaps Our Lady has recognized that in our time, it is of the, of the utmost importance to set an example of a truly Christian family life. The Holy Mother also described herself using several titles. Above all, she called herself the Immaculate Virgin from the Miraculous Metal Apparitions, 1830, to the Marian Visits at Lourdes, 1858, Pabianis, 1904, not familiar with that one, Fatima, 1917, Tui, 1929, and Borang, Mary persistently emphasized her Immaculate Conception. Mary also emphasized that Christians cannot love Christ without also loving his mother. Hence her two questions, do you love my son and do you love me? We can't love Mary without loving Jesus. As Pope Paul VI put it, Christian means Marian. All right, so a lot in there. I just want to draw out this. First, that that part about how she kept revealing herself in various apparitions as the Immaculate Virgin, pointing to uh, the truth of her Immaculate Conception, the truth of Mary's Immaculate Conception, that she was miraculously conceived in the womb of her mother. And um, that protects the the dignity, the, the truth about our Lord Jesus, that he comes through a pure vessel and that, and that God had prepared the way for him in such a way as to immaculately conceive Mary in the womb of her mother so that Mary was um, was free from the stain of original sin from her very conception. And so um, that's important because that, pr- pr- again, protects the truth about Jesus um, being true God, true man, coming through a perfect uh, a perfect human vessel um, without the taint of original sin. And so um, the fact is, is that many, again, in this era, in this time of Protestantism, post-Protestant Reformation, Protestant Revolution of the 16th century, so many people have rejected the Catholic Church, and yet they're still saying, Lord, Lord, about Jesus. So many people have rejected the Catholic Church and the truth about our Blessed Mother in a relationship of prayer with our Blessed Mother, who leads us more deeply than anybody else ever could, and than anything else ever could, into the heart of our Lord Jesus. So many ha- people have rejected the truth of the Immaculate Conception of Mary because they have rejected the truth of the Catholic Church that he instituted. We got to call these folks back. And again, it's in a gentle way by living it, but also being um, being honest about it and sharing the treasure that we have found. I think this is a great way to share maybe some of these simple apparitions with people who have lost the faith because Mary's pointing them back in a very simple and gentle way. Pray, right? Pray, be good always, right? Are you striving to actually live uh, the moral life. Um, so pray, be good always, and um, and offer yourself as a loving sacrifice in faith in Jesus, in faith in Mary. Pray the rosary, and when it's hard, pray it even when it's hard, and strive to meditate on those mysteries even when it's difficult. Offer yourself in that sacrifice of love. If you do these things, if you do these things, your your, your heart is going to become more and more like that immaculate heart of Mary, like that golden heart of the Madonna that is revealed here in Borang, Belgium, like the sacred heart of our Lord. This is who we are made to be more and more and more in the image and likeness 
of God. And so um, it's beautiful how Our Lady is drawing us back in, the, in these times by appearing to us in these ways. And there are so many different church approved apparitions like this, some that aren't fully approved yet, but have different things that, um, that would point towards approval. And there's a bunch of things like this. I want to highlight in this book, well, let me put the number out there right now. Maybe somebody has something to to call in and say and share with us. Certainly want to welcome you in to the conversation today. Anything that you want to add, 1-877-511-5483. That's 1-877-511-5483. One thing that struck me in looking at some of the more recent apparitions that have taken place Um, There were a couple that followed a certain pattern that I was not familiar with, that that it existed before. So these ones are not church approved, but they are given, um, they either, they have the mark here that they're either, they either have an imprimatur or or a Neil Obstet, if that's the way to say it, but, but an indication from the church that there is nothing in the messages that contradicts the gospel in any way, that they are in accordance with the gospel. These messages fit in with the gospel is basically what the church said. So that's a, a certain a certain form of approval, if not being fully approved at this point. Uh, but one was in Ireland in 2003. I kind of heard about this one before, but didn't know a great deal about it. Never really studied it or looked into it for myself. And, and maybe many of you are very familiar with it, but this lay woman, um, who, who uh, Our Lady gives her this pseudonym Anne so that she can remain anonymous to propagate the messages that Our Lady gives her. And, um, and she writes these volumes of direction for our time. So I have heard of this, Anne the lay apostle writing uh, th- these dire- this direction for our times. But what I want to point to is, is that these messages that she's given, a lot of it is really about um, you know the, the same things that all the, the Marian messages are about, pointing us back to the gospel in all of these ways. Um, but specifically, the, the example that's being shown here that Mary is leading us to is, is that we're being pointed to the dignity of motherhood, dignity of motherhood, the dignity of family life. Um, there, there's a lot in these messages, but to use a, an ordinary lay um, woman who's married at home with a family, and, um, and and there's some conversion in the life of Anne that takes place as this is all beginning and everything. I mean, it's an incredible story, but the point is is that um, she remains anonymous as well throughout the entire thing. Her bishop knows who she is, and so she's, she's always um, going to the bishop to make sure that every message that would come out would first go through him. Um, so that is a, a good mark, obedience to her bishop in this way. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really um, something incredible to see. If you're familiar with that, if you have any thoughts on that, feel free to call in and share them, one 511 5483 But then there, there's another one that follows sort of that same, that, that same idea, uh, that same pattern. And this one is, um, let's see here, this is... Uh, well, I'll, f- I'll find it as we get to the break and come out of the break because it's going to take me uh, flipping these pages a little bit. But but it's basically a very similar one in the sense that, again, it's a, it's a mom in a family. And, um, and Our Lady is coming to her to share the messages through this mom in a family and pointing us back to family life and, uh, and pointing back to the dignity of motherhood and the dignity of the family. We know that the, the final battle, as it was revealed to Sister Lucia, um, is going to be, um, you know, the, the devil attacking families. And it's against marriage and family. We certainly are seeing it in our time. So it makes sense that that would be emphasized in our time, as well as that one that we mentioned in the first segment about the, the unborn, that, uh, image, that, that image of um, of our Lord appearing in Our Lady of Guadalupe as an unborn child, as a human embryo in the womb of Mary from 2007 in Guadalupe. Look, this is what we've got to get back to, the truth, the fundamental truth about reality, right? Human beings are, are human beings from conception, fertilization. How do we get them? They, they are meant to come through a family, through the, the marital embrace, the marital act, right? Within marriage, right? Get back to chastity, get back to understanding human sexuality, right? And then, and then within marriage, within the family, a child comes forth, right? And this child is meant to be loved, 
love, not destroyed, certainly not destroyed. It's like the family is an image of the Holy Trinity. That's what it's meant to be. So the child is born and then welcomed in to share the life of the, of the mother and the father who are sharing life with one another. And this life is overflowing, right? The, the life between the, the mother and the father overflows into the life of the child. And the child is welcomed in to share that life as well in the life of a family. And then the family is meant to go and bear fruit. Their love should be overflowing into society in very various ways, right? And so this is what it's meant to be. We have lost the truth about the family. We have lost the truth about human sexuality. It's been robbed from us in our society. It's been robbed from us even within our church, not in the doctrine. The church still teaches rock solid on all of this. We've got the truth. It's all there in the Catholic faith, in the magisterial uh, authoritative teachings on faith and morals in the Catholic church. It's all the real deal and it's all right there rock solid for us. But sadly, in our time, we've got leaders that either they don't believe in it or they're too cowardly to proclaim it as they ought to. And they ought to be out there using the opportunity of our time to proclaim it to the world. What saints did of old is is that when there's a heresy, the saint would take up the opportunity to combat that heresy. They'd go proclaim the truth to the world. We've got a lot of heresy going on, but we don't have a lot of leaders stepping up, stepping out to proclaim that truth to the world. That is what we need. And so, look, Our Lady steps in in some private revelation here, various apparitions, and points us back to the truth about the family, the truth about life. We're going to get back to that when we get back. Stay tuned. The spirit world is fascinating, mysterious, complex, and potentially dangerous. Hi, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. And I'm Adam Bly. We're hosting a new show Saturdays on the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. We'll help you uncover some of the mysteries and answer your questions about angels, demons, eternal life, and how the spiritual and the physical worlds interact. Join us for The Spirit World every Saturday at 11 a.m. right here on the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is listener-funded, and we value your ongoing generosity. In this fast-paced world, it's easy to let your reoccurring donations slip due to something like a new address or a card number change. If you suspect that we do not have your up-to-date donor information, you can check with us during regular business hours at 1-877-888-6279, extension 104, or anytime online at thestationofthecross.com. Thank you. Do you love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. Hi, this is Joe McLean, host of the Catholic Drive Time Morning Show. Weekday mornings, 7 a.m. on the Station of the Cross. We'll keep you informed and inspired with insightful guests and breaking news stories of the day. That's the Catholic Drive Time. Weekday mornings, 7 a.m. on the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio app. We look forward to joining you on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network each weekday morning at 7 a.m. Praise be to Jesus. May God love you. Simple Truth, Jim Havens here. We are talking about the world of Marian apparitions today, using as our guide this book entitled The World of Marian Apparitions from Sophia Institute Press. It's their uh, their, their most popular book, best performing book ever. SophiaInstitute.com is where you can get it. Beautiful book, beautiful book. Lots of great things to, to pray about, ponder in here that ought to draw us back to the simplicity of living the gospel with our entire hearts, with our entire lives and um i want to get any callers that want to come in here in this final segment would love to hear from you call or text one 511 5483 
one 877 We're going to go to the phone line in just a minute. But first, I do just want to say to follow up from the last segment, I did find the, uh, the one apparition I was talking about, the other one about the mom. This is from the United States, actually, 1987. Again, it has like an imprimatur on it saying that there's nothing in these messages is contrary to the gospel. It, it is lined up. It is in accord with the gospel. And uh, I'll just read the, the opening paragraph here. It says, the visionary who inspired the apostolate of holy motherhood remained anonymous to the end. We know only that at the time of the apparitions and locutions in 1987, she was a young mother and that she lived in the United States. She went by the pseudonym Maria Monte, Latin for beloved Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary promised her, I shall always protect you from the public eye. Um, and then uh, I'll just give a little bit on the message here. Mary Amante, the, the Blessed Virgin, explained to Mary Amante, as you know, Satan is attacking the family and the priesthood as they are the holiest of vocations. It is through these vocations that the majority of my children come to me in heaven. When asked by the visionary how she was to know whether or not these messages came from her, Mary replied, you will know them. You will know that they come from me by the truth that is contained in them. It goes on from there. There's a lot in there here. This book is extensive. It is fun to dive into this stuff and learn about apparitions you never heard of before. And uh, some of them, I guarantee you will say, why have I never heard of this before? So plenty more to get to there. I hope you get the book, Sophia Institute. Uh, dot com is where you go, SophiaInstitute.com. But let's go to the phone lines now. I believe we've got James in New Jersey on the line. James, welcome to the program. What are your thoughts today? Hi, Jim. Um, I heard you mention Direction for Our Times, and I'm actually uh, very familiar with that. Um, there are 10 booklets, or, or what Ann calls volumes. And um, when God brought me back to the Catholic Church about 10 years ago, is when I discovered this. And volume two is called Conversations with the Eucharistic Heart of Jesus. If someone was interested in the, reading these volumes, I'd start with that one. Uh, it was when I was reading this that God gave me a revelation that he really is present, uh, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And then like maybe just a week later, as I continued reading that volume, uh, that the, he gave me a revelation that the Catholic Church is the one and only church founded by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is a lot of good advice and good information in these volumes. I encourage anybody, you know, to pick them up. I think you could go to Direction for Our Times. It's either .com or .org. You might be able to buy the volumes. You might even be able to download PDFs of the volumes for free, too. So uh, just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I appreciate that, James. And so, uh, so it sounds like this has uh, th this is something that uh, by experience, you reading these messages, um, it's borne a lot of good fruit in your life. Is that um, that that seems to be clear? Correct. Oh yeah, yeah. And I still read the booklets, you know, these volumes today. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's the information. You know, she has messages from saints, messages from the Blessed Mother. Um, that's of course Jesus speaking in the volumes. Um, it's really excellent. So uh, I encourage any uh, Catholic who wants to grow in their faith, um, you know, to pick up these volumes and, and and give them a read. I think you'd find it fascinating. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it, James. Thank you very much for the call today. And uh, you know, welcome. hang on the line. Hang on the line if you'd like. Uh, we'll get your rugged rosary out to you if, if we can give you a gift today. Would that be all right? Uh, that'd be terrific. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you again for the call, James. God bless you. And so again, that's Anne, the lay apostle. It's a pseudonym that Our Lady gave to her as she asked her to share these messages with the world. Back in 2003 is when this began in Ireland. And direction for our times is what they are called. Again, not a, not a, any full church approval at this point, but they do have um, something of an imprimatur. And she is obedient. She has been obedient to her bishop. Um, and so anything that she writes is not published without the consent of her local bishop. So that's pretty rock solid right there. Um, and um, let me share a little bit, I guess, from this message. What, what is she? 
what is she sharing here? Again, it's always going to point back to the heart of the gospel, uh, but with, with different things that are being emphasized for our time that, that perhaps we've lost, right? And, and so um, let's look at this. It says, look at how many, many souls follow the ways of this world. So this would be a message of our Blessed Mother um, to be shared with us to from Anne, the, this lay apostle direction uh, for our times. Look at how many, many souls follow the ways of this world. Perdition awaits them if God's chosen children do not react. Let your heart soften at the thought of this, my little ones. Help your mother to lead them all safely back to Jesus. My heart suffers because of my little ones. They are at a, at a loss in despair. I am close to them, waiting for them to but glance at me so that I might make haste to console them and show them the way. Unfortunately, they look everywhere but to heaven. Hitherto, the world has not seen such times. People are ashamed to ask God for help as they think it is a sign of weakness. They are afraid to trust. They think that they thus become like children, and it is indeed so. They must become like children to enter the kingdom of heaven, which will be their eternal home. We must help souls to understand that the time has come to return to Jesus. Time is short. It cannot be seen otherwise. I want all souls to be convert converted to Jesus in the silence of their hearts, and I shall lead them by the hand." And so, yeah, powerful messages here. And again, it's always just pointing back to receive the, the, the truth of the faith, pointing back to Jesus. And Our Lady wants to lead us to Jesus, lead us back to Jesus and his Catholic Church that he died to give us. You can't separate them. You can't say, I love Jesus, but I reject his Catholic Church. I reject the fullness of the sacramental life. You're in error. You're wrong, even if you're sincerely wrong. And, and we say that in all charity. If you're listening and that's the case, we love you. Come on back. Look at the rosary. What would be your problem with the rosary? It is simply praying the mysteries of the life of our Lord with Our Lady. What would be wrong with that? Going to Our Lady and looking at the heart of Jesus, helping who, who better understands him, who better knows him, um, than, than his mother, than Mary. Who, who would know him better? Who would be able to lead us better, especially because, and again, you have to accept the, the truth on this, that, that she was conceived without sin. That's not making her God in any way. That's making her a human being that was preserved from, from having to be stained by original sin as we all, all of us, contract it from our original parents. She was free of it. No concupiscence, no, uh, no stain of original sin at all. And so that makes her unique among all all of us human beings, all of us human persons. She's at the top of the list and she said yes and she fully participated with God with everything. That's who we want to be like. That's what we want to be like. And she's going to lead us to do that. Let's take her hand. Let's pray the Holy Rosary. Strive to pray the mysteries. And I want to end with that. Some of these messages as you read them, that's one of the recurring themes as well. Not to just pray the rosary, but to pray it well. And Mary is serious about this, to really pray it. And Jesus speaks of this too, I think, in one of the messages that I was reading about, to pray the rosary well. So fight those distractions. Get back to really putting your attention and your affection into the prayer, into the holy mystery. So don't just rattle them off, right? Let's really look at the mystery that we are praying and really see what our Lord has for us. What does he want to show us about himself? And forget ourselves, worship our Lord as we pray those mysteries, right? And if we can get good at this, if we can build that virtue, build that habit, we will be more free to pray the rosary well. But it's going to take a battle for us to get there. We've got to battle the distractions and not to get too upset about it or anything like that. Very gently, very calmly. We experience distractions all the time in praying the rosary or in our prayers. As soon as we notice, we just bring ourselves back. And we keep doing that. Put the effort in and participation with God's grace. But don't give up. Don't, don't give up and give way to those distractions. All right? So, Our Lady, pray for us. Our Lord, we love you. And, um, yeah, we, we want to do all that we can do. So, God, please help us to do your holy will. Amen. In the book, 